My name is Susan Thomases. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communication at Landmark School. And uh, our department uh, hosts these Landmark Learns, and they are webinar series on thematic topics. This year, our thematic topic is dyslexia. Um, the first one was a session by our head of school, Josh Clark, and that was sort of just a primer on dyslexia. And this is part two, supporting your child with dyslexia at home. And that will be, we're featuring Ann Andrew, who is a uh, veteran landmark school teacher and mom of three sons with dyslexia. Um, before we get started, I wanna just go through a little bit of housekeeping. Um, everybody who is registered will receive um, a recording and Anne's resources. Uh, either at the end of this week or early next week. So rest assured that you do not need to take notes. You certainly can if you want to. She's going to share a lot of information. Um, and I'd also like to invite you to attend future Landmark Learns webinars with us. Um, we're going to be doing something called Navigating Dyslexia as Adults in the Workforce on February 8th. If you registered for this, which I expect that you did because you're here with us now, you will definitely receive an invitation to that. Then on March 7th, we're going to do one called Dyslexia at School, What Parents Need to Know. And then we're going to do something on April 24th um, featuring a researcher. Um, hold on one second. Got to get the title of this. I It's called... Uh, her name is Gabby Schlichtman, and it's going to be Building Your Child's Positive Self-Concept, Strategies for Students with Learning Differences. So we've got lots in store, but I don't want to waste any time um, because Anne has a ton to share. So I am going to introduce Anne Andrew right now, and um, I'm going to kind of disappear. We're going to leave about 10, 15 minutes at the end of this presentation for Q&A. If you have any questions, because we're in webinar format, the chat is disabled. You need to put all your questions in the Q&A. I would ask that you try to generalize your questions. We're not going to be able to address questions that um, are very specific to your school or your child's circumstances. So um, if you can, just put those questions in the q and I can see that there are already two, which is great. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Anne. Thank you, Susan. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so honored to be asked to do this. Um, Susan mentioned I, I'm a teacher at Landmark Elementary Middle School, and I have three wonderful sons with varying degrees of dyslexia. They're all teenagers now. Um, one is actually 21. So um, yeah, I have years and years of experience in this realm. Um, I received my undergraduate degree in marketing from UMass Amherst and spent most of my career as an executive in the clothing industry, which was so fun. Um, I stayed home with my sons when, when they were born, and um, my firstborn was diagnosed back in 2011. And at that point, I went on to become certified in Orton-Gillingham, um, thinking I would help him. Um, I started a private practice. And then in 2017, I followed my youngest son, who's now a Landmark senior, here to teach at Landmark School, um, where I, I teach LA, OE, I've taught math, and then, of course, the one-on-one -on -one tutorial. And I also obtained my master's in special education from BU here through Landmark. Um, one of the things I'm most proud about in my years at Landmark is initiating a um, a, a advocacy program for seventh and eighth graders. Um, and we're going to talk about that a lot today. And in fact, we have one of my former students, Lola, in the audience today. And if you can stay till the very end, we're going to watch her presentation, which is absolutely amazing. Um, so thank you, Lola, for being here somewhere out there. Um, other activities that I've been involved in, um, I was a stay-at-home mom, so I, I I did have a little bit of time on my hands, um, especially once the kids were in school, and that's when I became really involved in decoding dyslexia, Massachusetts, um, where I was a in in the past I was a legislation team leader. Um, I also had the opportunity to start a program through Learning Ally here in Massachusetts called the Youth, Youth Ambassador Program. Um, youth examples of self-advocacy is what it was. Were, 
called. And it was a mentor program that paired high school students to younger students with dyslexia, which was amazing. And that's kind of what um, inspired me to do this type of work at Landmark School. I'm also trained through the Federation of Children with Special Needs and Rights Law in Educational Advocacy. Um, I sit on the Attorney General's Disability Rights Advisory Committee. We meet um, quarterly. And in the past, I've, I've run my local school special education parents advisory committee. Um, so in the presentation tonight, I just want to say that I'm speaking from my personal experience in dealing with special education. Um, the years were like starting in 2007 until today. So a lot has changed since 2007. Much has changed for the better. Um, but I just want to let you know my experience is really like I'm, I'm self-taught and um, through my professional development at Landmark and through BU, I'm not a neuropsychologist. I'm not a lawyer. Um, I'm just going to speak to you about what I've experienced as a mom and a teacher, which, you know, you become, I'm a therapist, I'm a coach, <laughs> a detective. I know you can all relate, you parents out there. Um, I also want to say I have like a lot of respect for um, public school teachers um, the largest, the largest class I've ever taught has eight students in it. So I, you know, respect to all the teachers out there that have 25, 26, 27 kids. And I will try not to offer my opinion, but I've been known to do that. Um, please know that it's my opinion and not necessarily the opinion of Landmark School. Okay. I think my three sons are up, right? Um, these are my three little guys on their first day of preschool. We all have pictures like this at home. Um, excited, happy, engaged, um, outgoing. And um, they stayed like that for a couple of years until kindergarten started. And within six months of kindergarten, um, each, you know, was, the phone calls were coming in from the teachers. Like, I think we have a problem. Um, so my firstborn, Johnny, who's on the left in the red sweater, um, Looking back, I sh he struggled with oral expression and um, had a really hard time with the foundational reading skills. He received some services on an IEP, um, but he was deemed remediated at the end of third grade. Uh, not knowing any better, I agreed. Um, we removed his IEP, and then in fourth grade, his teacher pulled me aside and said, you know, I really think there's still something going on. You need to have him evaluated outside of school which was when he was diagnosed with dyslexia. Um, flash way forward, uh, he attended a couple of years um, at a private college in Rhode Island and really struggled. He's a, a 2020 graduate. So he's like smack dab in the middle of COVID. So he struggled for a couple of years in college, um, got passing grades, but decided, you know, like I need a gap year. I need to see what's going on with my life. And he found a program, I live in Gloucester. He found a program here in Gloucester, uh, Gloucester Marine Genomics. He loves science. And he got a chance to do a year program with them, including an internship where he ended up landing a job and has a fantastic job um, as a lab tech in a, star, a tech startup company. And he's very, very happy. And I'm happy for him. Um, my middle son, and Benjamin in the middle, um, we were, we were on top of things. There's a four year age difference there. And we knew as a toddler, he was having a really hard time with speech. He received some early intervention. Um, but by the end of first grade, things had really come to a really hard stop. Um, we pulled him out of school and I homeschooled him for the spring, which was, um, that was before any formal a teaching experience. So we had some fun, but um, then we transferred schools. We schooled choice. He did a little bit of Wilson. Um, and then in fifth grade, um, the district agreed to contract with an Orton Gillingham tutor who's out there in the audience somewhere. Audrey is a, a miracle. Um, Audrey saw Ben four days a week for an hour, starting at seven 30 in the morning. Um, because we didn't want him to miss any of his school day. So talk about resilience. That little kid and Audrey got there at the crack of dawn um, to do some good solid Orton Gillingham tutoring. Um, but by the end of fifth grade, um, and with the support of a outside evaluation, um, the district agreed that you know he needed outside placement and he started at Landmark as a sixth grader. Um, 
which was amazing right from the get-go. So he's now a senior, ready to graduate, um, has been accepted to all the colleges he applied to, and will we'll decide or he'll decide, I've learned, he'll decide what he wants to do. And then my middle son on the far right, Will, he was a stealthy little kid and appeared to be reading well, and his spelling was unbelievable. He was the kid that sat at the kitchen table and didn't need any help at all. Um, excellent writer, solid communication skills. And then in fourth grade, he started to show a lot of trouble with math fluency and learning his math facts. Um, we asked for evaluations. He was evaluated by the school several times, um, denied IEPs a lot. <laughs> um, I think six times we went to the table between fourth grade and eighth grade. And um, I guess I had lost my fight a little bit. We, we left that district, um, tried another district, but again, COVID is happening now. It was kind of a nightmare. Um, so in 2019, he um, was seen by his, by Ardner, our psychologist. And at that point, he had also developed some significant anxiety. So this is where I come from. Um, I, I hope to unpack some of the lessons I've learned over the past 21 years as a parent and, and as a teacher of exceptional kids who need exceptional care. So today, in today's presentation, we're going to talk about dyslexia. I assume most of it, most of you in the audience have such a, a big background on this already, but we are going to talk a little bit about the early signs and um, what Nadine Gab, one of my favorite people, refers to as the dyslexia paradox. We're going to talk about the importance of early identification, myths and facts. Then we're going to dive into the diagnosis and the importance of having an, an individualized educational evaluation. Um, the neuropsych eval. And we're going to talk about the bell curve, some tips on that. And then we're really going to talk a lot about common co-occurrences because um, social challenges, anxiety, ADHD, and executive functioning problems are very frequent um, comorbidities with dyslexia. Then we're going to have, oh, communication, um, the importance of communication, parent advocacy, and then really importantly, child advoca advocacy or student advocacy. And that's when Lola will come in at the end and uh, share her story. Okay. Um, so this slide, which again, some of you may have seen, is basically just talks about um, the that that intervention is most effective in kindergarten, first grade, those early years, yet what we find in schools is that that the diagnosis doesn't usually happen until later, second grade, third grade, in my case, fourth grade for my my eldest son. Um, so, you know, that's after the window for the most effective intervention has closed. As kids get older, the statistics get scarier. It takes four times as long to remediate a child's poor reading skills in fourth grade as in kindergarten, or early first grade. Um, what's important here is um, just this year, July 1st of this year, schools are required to screen kids for learning reading problems. Um, so they have to they have to test the kids twice a year from kindergarten to third grade. And if a child falls far behind, schools must give them extra help based on their needs. That's a quote from Desi. <laughs> um, the other thing I want to note on this slide, as we're talking about um, Nadine Gab, who's um, a professor at Harvard Medical School, she is conducting a study that looks at early preliteracy screenings in pediatric practices. And the study is called Sprouted, um, and it aims to get ahead of reading problems in a preventative medicine manner, similar to how we screen for ADHD at our pediatrician appointments. Um, really important, something that's been on her um, list for many years, and I'm so excited that she's that she's um, started this. And there's a link to this sprouted in the resource section for those of you that have little young kids. So we'll talk about some early signs of dyslexia, um, the difficulty with phonemic awareness, such as identifying and manipulating sounds and words, hearing the words. Um, and manipulating those sounds, difficulty with decoding words, sounding out words, recognizing letter sound correspondences, difficulty with spelling is a huge red flag, 
uh, reading comprehension, understanding the meaning of the text, making connections between ideas. In addition, any indication of a speech delay, um, mispronunciation of words, difficulty with rhyming, trouble with directionality. Oops, sorry, I'm gonna, oops, pronunciation of words, <laughs> rhyming um, and directionality or sequencing could be an indication of dyslexia. Um, many of, there are some additional characteristics of school age children that are often seen as ADHD like, um, like inability to finish work in a timely manner, poor attention, poor organization, um, which is yet another reason why dyslexia so often goes diagnosed. And as we know, in the pediatrician's office, we're always forever filling out those ADHD questionnaires. Okay, so early identification and remediation. So, um, Dyslexia, as we know, can be diagnosed in early childhood and it must be remediated with integrity. This graph is from the University of Oregon and it shows how kids learn to read from grades one through three. The green line at the top shows typical readers and the red line shows struggling readers. If the graph continued, we'd see that with a rem without remediation, that gap would continue to widen. But with the right intervention, our kids can catch up as shown in this graph from the Florida Center for Reading Research. That dotted line in the middle shows that with intensive uh, remediation, our kids do begin to close the gap. And we know that you know, at-risk beginning readers, when they receive intensive and appropriate inter intervention and instruction, up to 92% will be able to read in the average range. Next, we'll talk a bit about some common myths about dyslexia. Okay, first myth. We should wait and see what happens with our struggling children. The fact is this wait to fail model is not only untrue, but immoral. With early intensive and evidence-based intervention, kids with dyslexia can learn to read like their non-dyslexic peers. And the more we wait, the harder it is and the more expensive it is to remediate. Myth number two, um, accommodations or modifications are sufficient for children with learning language-based learning problems, or we hear accommodations are cheating. Um, the fact is accommodations and modifications without a diagnosis are simply a band-aid. Our kids need to learn the underlying skills in order to become independent. And there should never be an accommodation without a related goal. So check your IEPs and make sure, if, for those of us that have I, individualized education plans, make sure that every single accommodation has a goal that you can connect back to that. A third myth, um, people with dyslexia will never enjoy reading. I can say for sure that is absolutely not true. Um, the students I teach um, do eventually absolutely love, love to read, and they're so excited to finish those chapter books once they break the code. And listening to books counts too. Ear reading is reading. We say that. Um, I do want to stress, though, that it's while well, audiobooks are wonderful, especially um, human read audiobooks, the human voice, it's important that the kids follow along so that they can build up that word recognition. So my kids are annoyed when I, uh, my students are annoyed when I ask them to follow along, but it's it's really important that they begin, that they attach the 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 spoken word with the written word. Okay, so we also know that dyslexia is this, this this slide's yucky, but we know that dyslexia dyslexia is associated with reduced self-esteem, vocabulary, and overall academic achievement. And we know that unremediated dyslexia is associated with higher rates of entry into the, to the justice system, school dropout, and social emotional challenges. So next, we're going to talk about the diagnosis and the evaluation process, um, specifically the um, going outside to get an independent evaluation. Does your gut tell you something is off? You will be right. So this um, requesting evaluations, first of all, know that in Massachusetts, state law requires that schools identify children who have a disability, as well as diagnose and evaluate the needs of such children and propose a special education program to meet those needs. This is this law, that's a quote from Child Find, they must find students with learning challenges and they must propose a special education program to meet the needs. Um, I, most advocates and 
Um, I agree that it's important to uh, rule out any kind of hearing or vision problems. And with that, you don't want to just go to the pediatrician's office. You want to go to um, have go, go to um, you know an audiologist or an ophthalmologist for the vision. Um, some people go ahead and have a central auditory processing evaluation done. And these are all done covered by insurance. And that's really important that we rule those things out. Um, you can ask the school, put it in writing, put everything in writing, and um, and they can help you get that process started. Um, regarding the um, neuros neuropsychological, um, I, I, I can't say, I, I've had the most luck when I've had a private neuropsychologist um, involved. It's, um, you know, it's a, it's a third party, it's an outside party. And I think that that's, um, I won't say too much more other than um, the most luck I've had is with a private independent neuropsychologist. I've also had a lot of luck with an independent speech and language pathologist. I know that um, schools often have a speech and language pathologist. It's really important to have that um, comprehensive evaluation done to compare the written and verbal language skills. And also, I just wanted to give a shout out a little bit for assistive technology evaluation, especially for older students. Some advocates say um, as young as fourth grade. I've seen it younger than that, too. It's um, assistive technology can be something as simple as audiobooks or as complex as a text to speech program. But what's really important is once your child has an assistive technology evaluation, that um, first of all, it's not meant to replace direct instruction. We want to make sure that it's not to it's not instead of the teaching, it's an addition to. But um, the technology that's proposed by the specialist needs to be explicitly taught and practiced. Uh, teachers need to know how to use it, and they need to know how to teach it, and it should be used throughout the day and at home as appropriate. I've seen often that not happen and um, it's kind of useless if you don't know how to use the assistive technology. So um, also just note that overall, schools do provide evaluations, but they might not cover all the required extensive testing that you need. Um, they'll probably be conducting cognitive ability achievement testing um, in conjunction with your independent testing. So you don't wanna have any delay. So if you have, can have both going on at the same time, um, personally, I just feel like I, I like the, the um, comprehensive testing to, to be done by the neuropsychologist, the independent neuropsychologist. So when you seek the comprehensive evaluation, you want to um, ask around. You need to find evaluators who can explain the results in simple language to both you and your child. Um, really important to get the child's involvement. Um, my personal neuropsychologist has a special meeting just for my kids, and I'm not even invited anymore because they're over 18. Um, evaluation should be comprehensive, highlighting strengths and offering specific recommendations for both instruction and accommodations. Encourage the private evaluators to observe the child beyond the clinical setting if they can visit at the school or at home. Gather input from the school always. Um, incorporate historical data from the school and from parents and provide detailed recommendations. And then really, really important is that they attend the, the, the meeting, the independent educational evaluation, IEE meeting, um, to report their, um, their findings. That makes a huge difference if they're there. Um, and they can also help with the, the IEP if it's deemed appropriate. They can do also, it doesn't have to be in person now, now I've they're going virtually too. Um, follow up and progress checks. So you're gonna to wanna to schedule a team meet meeting after all these evaluations are done by both the school and the private evaluators. Um, and then some evaluators might suggest a follow up um, on the day of, or when they share their findings. And it's good to book that that day because they they um, they book up a year in advance from is what I'm hearing these days. And we're gonna always wanna repeat these key evaluations to monitor progress. Um, also, I just want to note that there, in your resources that you'll be sent, there's um, something from um, LD Online, uh, Basics for Parenting, Your Child's Evaluation, and another called Parents to Parent, 10 Things I Wish Someone Had Told Me. Um, so you'll, you'll get all that in your resources after this presentation. 
Oh, the bell curve. I love the bell curve. It took me forever to figure it out. But now that I, now that I understand it, it's such a great visual. Um, it's helpful for both you and your, your child. So, and please forgive me if you all know this already, but I like to just visualize the bell curve. It's a hill and the top of the hill is average. The average is um, marked from 85 to 115. That's the average range. This particular bell curve happens to be my son's when he was a senior in high school. Um, after he's he had great remediation from his private Orton Gillingham tutor. Um, and with this, we're able to explain to our kids, I was able to explain to him that, um, I hope you can see this, like his fluid reasoning, I think it says 123, that that was an, um, one of his exceptional strengths. And then we talked about his working memory over here. Well, I'm pointing, but you guys can't see where I'm pointing. The working memory on the left side of the bell curve was a relative challenge. And we talked about how that impacts his academics. Um, interestingly, his processing speed isn't really a problem, but um, for many of our kids with dyslexia, they'll have low processing speed, um, which complicates fluency and automaticity. But all that being said, processing speed is different from processing ability. We need to tell our kids that they can be both smart and slow. So it's really important that we that we minimize these challenges and let them know that speed isn't everything. This particular curve um, that you're seeing was created using a program by um, that I purchased. It's a purchase program, Dr. Vaughn Lauer, called Special Education Decoder. Um, and there's a link to that also in the resource section. I have no affiliation. I just love it. And it's really, really meaningful at meetings to pull this up on a presentation and be able to, it's interactive. So you can hover over the dots. Um, it's been very, very helpful in my IEP meetings with my kids. And also there's a bell curve printable resource at the that you'll be provided that sort of explains the bell curve better than I just did. Um, okay. And can I just yeah. interrupt you for two seconds? It's Susan yeah. and let you know that we can see your cursor as a pointer. So feel free to use oh, that. So when I do this, you can see me? Yeah. Do that? Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Okay. Yeah. I'm start to my that's great. Thank you, Susan. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. So um, these next few slides are talking about um, some common co-occurrences with dyslexia, including social skills, deficits, anxiety, and ADHD or delayed executive functioning. And I'm spending time with this um, because the statistics are really alarming and these conditions can creep up on us. Uh, they crept up on me as a mom. And I just want to Keep it front and center for all of us as our kids become adolescents, especially. So here are some statistics. Um, rates of ADHD, anxiety disorders, and depressive disorders are all elevated for kids with reading disabilities. Children with dyslexia are more likely to experience both external symptoms of mental health challenges, like disruptive behavior, and internal ones, like anxiety and sadness. Children with learning differences are vulnerable to stigma, and negative stereotypes, and they often struggle with low self-esteem and feeling that they are unintelligent. Um, a large study of elementary school children found that students who struggled with reading in third grade were about twice as likely as their peers to consider themselves angry, distractible, sad, lonely, and unpopular by the time they reached fifth grade. Um, a national study found that over a third of students experiencing reading difficulties were involved in bullying, either as the victim, the bully, or both, compared with about a fifth of students with reading difficulties, without reading difficulties. I find that interesting because we always, for those of us that attend IEP meetings, <laughs> we parents, um, they always ask you, is your child vulnerable for bullying? And we always say, oh, no, no, he's not. But keep that, be careful with that. Like, think about that before you check that box. Um, finally, teenagers with learning disorders, including dyslexia, have been found to experience general emotional distress at twice the rate of kids without learning disorders. So sorry for the bummer here. Um, we're going to get into social skills next in detail. So often social skills um, are excused as, or difficulty with social skills are excused as developmental dis delays. Um, they might present as physically or socially immature in comparison to their peers. 
their reduced ability to keep up with verbal and nonverbal cues often lead to awkwardness in social situations. In fact, about a half, I just discovered this, about a half of all people with dyslexia have difficulty with oral expression. So it's understandable that insecurities in keeping up with social communication are common. It's not uncommon for people with dyslexia to have trouble finding the right words or have difficulty following rapid conversations, the back and forth, and they often miss the gist. Um, one of my sons would, um, when he was in middle school, would complain that his friends don't follow his stories, they kind of check out, um, or that he was often so late in getting to the joke or adding to the conversation that it's already moved on, and that's painful. Um, eventually, many of these kids simply simply stop trying and they go inward. Anxiety. Anxiety is the most frequent emotional symptom reported by adults with dyslexia. Understandably, I think. Uh, children with dyslexia may display signs of depression, oppositional or disengaged behavior as a result of feeling misunderstood or pressured to perform tasks beyond their current abilities. This leads to anxiety and fear about um, not meeting others' expectations. Parents and teachers see bright, enthusiastic kids and are flabbergasted with the child's struggle with reading. Eventually, kids anticipate failure, and those who are chronically invalidated or misunderstood learn to shut down or act out. Um, again, this is, you know, we, my um, son's kindergarten teacher called him a puzzle. He's such a puzzle. He seems so smart. So, you know, and he didn't want to let her down. And, you know, my kids tell me today that they they just always wanted to make me proud. Um, and they do. <laughs> um, but it's important. Anxiety is, is a big one. Um, executive functioning and ADHD. Um, importantly, everyone with ADHD has trouble with executive functioning. And then there are many people that don't have the diagnosis of ADHD, but do have learning difficulties, and they also have trouble with executive functioning skills. Um, so it, it's I, I like what this Dr. Thomas Brown describes as ADHD equals developmental impairment of the brain's executive functioning. So they're so, so similar. Um, and these challenges, the executive functioning challenges impact more than just attention though. Kids will have trouble with organization, self-regulation. Um, importantly, many of us have been told that our kids have ADHD, but often the issue is more far reaching. So we should ask questions um, if a doctor has diagnosed your child with ADHD without addressing the possibility of a learning problem or an aud even an auditory processing disorder. So next, I'll dive into the social emotional impact of being a child with learning differences. And then we're going to get back to executive functioning in a minute. But um, this slide's really cool. Um, I, I, I consulted with a, with a dear friend, um, Dr. Steve Dykstra, on this because he is the expert here on um, trauma and reading challenges. So Steve says... Um, going to school day after day, week after week, for years while being unable to read or read well is frequent and repetitive trauma for the student. So this really hit home because, you know, we think of trauma as something awful, like that isn't happening at school, but it, it certainly can be happening at school for our kids that repeatedly fail and don't find help. Steve went on to say, if you survey kids in first grade and ask them to name the smartest kids in the classroom, for the most part, they will name the same few children. Those children will be the kids who read the best out loud. So we can wonder whether dyslexia naturally only co-occurs with social, emotional, and intentional disorders, which it certainly does, but does it also make them worse? Certainly there are children whose ADHD might go unnoticed if they could read better, and anxiety that wouldn't burn so brightly if the child didn't have a persistent fear of their reading difficulties going on full display at any moment. Think of a thing you fear, a thing you dread, swimming, heights, snakes, spiders, anything. Now imagine being required to be in the midst of that thing, eight hours a day, 180 days a year, for 13 or 14 years, beginning at age four or five. 
And what if no one helps to make it better? What if they just insist you keep showing up? Wow. So also, I, I just want to mention that kind of related to this, there's um, another link on Eric Erickson's eight stages of development, which I was unaware of when I was raising my, my toddlers. Um, and it talks about how environment and personal interactions impact our kids' emotional well-being. Um, so that was, that I think you might find that interesting. It's just a YouTube video, I think. So we're gonna move a little bit more deeply into executive functioning. Um, this is a busy slide, but this is what executive functioning is. It's all these things. Um, we have to start something, we have to prioritize, plan ahead. We've got to manage our time. We've got to remember all these details, organize, you know, consolidate everything and then shift and start over again. It's this, it's this vicious cycle of, um, our frontal lobe working on overload. And I think, um, I almost wore my t-shirt today that says CEO, but my kids wouldn't let me, but it, it's, um, the, the brain itself, the, the frontal lobe where executive functioning lives isn't fully developed until our twenties. And I've heard recently, even like up to 26 for boys. So I'm not there yet. One of these days it gets better though, slowly and surely we start to see things improve. Um, executive functioning just asks us basically to plan and organize our actions in order to achieve a goal. So everything is goal driven. Um, and there's also in the resources section, there's another printable, an excellent printable um, from Harvard Center on the Developing Child. And once you get in there, you're gonna be in the rabbit hole like I was. There's tons of information um, on the Harvard website about um, executive functioning. So next I'm gonna share a way um, I learned to think about executive functioning that I found really helpful. Again, it's a visual that I can keep in my head, um, referred to as hill, skill, and will. Hill, yeah, hill, skill, and will. Um, so this work came from, Susan, I'm right on time. This work came from um, Lynn Meltzer, who's an expert in executive functioning, and she wrote a book called Executive Function in Education. And there's a chapter that was co-authored by Howard Gardner from Harvard. Um, and he refers, he discusses executive functioning as the integration of three conditions, hill, skill, and will. And I love this because I can, again, I, I'm talking about, I, I can visualize this and I, I'm able to teach it to my children and my students. The hill is the goal. We all have this giant hill that we need to climb. That's our goal. The skill, those of course are the abilities we need in order to, to climb the hill, to achieve the goal. And then of course, will is just that determination to persevere until the goal is achieved. And I'm gonna um, move on to the next slide. We're gonna dive right into the goal section. Okay, so maybe some of us have seen this SMART acronym. We're gonna talk about that in a second, but the hill is the goal. Um, my son, Ben, who's the senior at Landmark, ready to graduate, he has counseled me over the years on what to do and what not to do as a teacher, how to be like a cool teacher. And I have a list of what I refer to as my Benisms that I keep handy. It's on my note section on my phone. And one of my favorites is don't assume that kids aren't motivated. They might not know how to do the thing or they don't have a clear goal. So this is out of the mouths of babes. You know, he told me that when he was like 16 um, and it sticks with me. So we need to have our, all of our kids at home and at school need to have smart goals for everything. They need to be specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. And the way I visualize the hill here is we want our hill to be smooth. We don't want this steep incline. We don't want it to be too bumpy. The hill needs to be gradual and smooth. The kids should, and also our kids should be part of the goal setting process. There's research out there that says the more we involve kids in setting goals, the more vested they are in, 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 in their buy-in. So that makes sense. Um, so moving on from Hill, we're gonna go to skill and where Ben talks about not knowing how to do the thing. This is what we're, we're gonna talk about next when kids don't know how to do the thing. So skills are strategies and tools we use to achieve our goals. And I love this quote by uh, John Dewey, he's an educator. Persons, children or adults are interested in what they can do successfully in what they approach with confidence and engage in with a sense of accomplishment. 
Yes. And to be successful, we need skill. And the skills need to be taught and practiced with regularity. I really hope you can't hear my dog crying. Um, so in order to apply our skills, we need tools. Just like builders need hammers and saws to practice their skills and chefs need pans and whisks. It's the brain having the skill to know what to do with the tools that result in success. Um, in education, we can compare this to the use of a graphic organizer and the fact that this graphic organizer is of no use to the child if they don't know how to use it, if they don't know how to select the graphic nor organizer and they've never been explicitly taught and practiced how to use it with regularity. Um, similarly, spell check or spelling prediction is great, but if a child can't identify the correct spelling once presented with options, it won't be very helpful. Uh, they first must be explicitly taught how to read, how to decode. So with skill, my tip for parents is, um, and what I learned the hard way, is if nights are ending in tears because of homework, you need to abort it. You need to send a note to the teacher saying that your child tried, um, and it was beyond their particular skill level in whatever whatever the subject was. Um, in my humble opinion, homework should be practice of a taught skill. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't think it's fair for us to send our kids home as teachers to send students home with homework that they can't accomplish and find success. Um, they, with success, when they are able to achieve their goal of completing their homework, they build their self-confidence and self-efficacy. They can reach their goals. So back to what Ben said, if the hill is too steep or the goal is too high or the kids don't have the skill, they're not going to find success. And also, again, a plug for a resource from a group called Transforming Education. It's all about the importance of self-efficacy. That's also attached, or that will be in your um, resources. Next, Will. So um, people with dyslexia often have to work longer and harder to achieve the same level as their non-dyslexic counterparts. So we have a goal. We have the skills to reach their goal, that goal, and now we need the will to persevere. That's hard, and that comes with um, maturity. But um, what I think can be helpful is um, finding a role model or a mentor is is meaningful. Um, you know, I I think connecting upperclassmen to younger students has I've seen that happen, and I've seen some schools do that where they have student mentors. Um, at Landmark, it happens, but that's, that's, you know, I understand not every school is Landmark, um, but it's important to make connections with other families through the CPAC. And then maybe even, um, I've always had this dream that there should be something like a student-led um, advisory committee. And, you know, I've always had a dream that like the, it, it all actually kind of started in one of the schools I worked with where they had um, high school juniors and seniors work with younger students. And that's amazing if they can find someone that they connect to that's similar to them. Um, also, there are resources made by dyslexia is part of your links. You'll be able to find a link for that. And um, there are some other resources that I'll talk about in a couple more slides. But finding a role model or a mentor is huge. Knowing that they're not alone, a sense of belonging. Um, making a plan. Um, our kids do well when larger tasks like these big goals are broken into smaller steps or objectives. Um, so you can help them make a plan. Um, they can help them map things out as they, you know, their work, their, their um, homework or assignments. And also have them, don't let them do any multitasking. They're not good at it yet. Avoid multitasking. Celebrate small victories. Help them learn to let go of the judgment of failure. Not being a super fast reader is not good or bad. Uh, point out what your child does well, reinforce, reinforce their effort and persistence, not the end result, the grades. Um, and then break bad habits. Try to, uh, you know, procrastination happens a lot at my house and we're trying to break that bad habit. Phones are away when homework happens and that only increases the perseverance. So to wrap up this concept of hill skill and will and back to what Ben said, um, Kids need to know how to do the thing in order to find success and motivation. Okay, so this slide talks a little bit about um, just a couple of um, tips, visual, visual tips to help with organization of time and materials at home. So 
Um, I'll go over what I have here first and then I'll just give my other spiel. So these three examples are probably for younger students. The first is an example of a visual um, checklist. So um, visuals are very helpful, especially for younger students to, to sort of see if they if they're not decoding the words very well. This this can be posted to I had one in my son's bathroom when he was really little. Um, then some of you might know the work of Sarah Ward, who is a guru in executive functioning. She has a concept she calls ready, do, done, where the, um, this is an example on our homework table here at home, where, um, my kid had everything he needs to do his homework. He's got his calculator, his pencils, his sticky notes. He's got a thesaurus, I think. Um, and then that's just construction paper, yellow, red, and green. Yellow is what he's working on. Green, oh, sorry, yellow is to, hold on. I think yellow is the ready stack. Then it moves to the green, which is what I'm working on right now, the do stack. And then when it's done, it moves on to the red stack. So it's a little bit juvenile, but definitely fun for um, elementary age students, I think. And then this this on the far right is a countdown timer, which um, it's excellent. Kids can have a visual reminder of how much how much longer, how many more minutes do I have to do my homework? That's available on Amazon. I think I bought mine on Amazon. Um, eventually, we're going to remove all of these scaffolds because our kids won't need them anymore once they learn how to plan, prioritize, and monitor themselves. Um, older kids, I don't have pictures of anything, but day planners are great. Um, we use day planners religiously at Landmark. Um, sometimes it's helpful. We ask them to estimate how much time it's going to take them to finish something and then write down how long it actually took them. That helps develop their their um their awareness of how long things take um older middle school and older should be exposed to other systems and adopt whatever they prefer google calendar apple notes um, and this is where that at evaluation might be helpful um i don't know I, my kids always like to do the hard homework first and we always had snacks and movement breaks and and, and keep things simple um at landmark we we have a two pocket folder that um one one side is to do and the other side is done and that's all the kids have to manage when they when they hand in their work so that's super helpful instead of all these separate binders okay we're moving on how am i doing for time um, oh i'm a little late um communication so this is um the importance of communication we need to communicate with our kids this quote from angela dewey who's from child mind institute there's a resource attached here um when understanding their learning profile, understanding their challenges, and also understanding their strengths, kids are better able, able to tailor their experiences toward the things that they're good at and the things that they're interested in. So I just can't stress enough how important it is for kids to understand their learning profile. So I'm going to fly through this slide because we're going to talk about this a lot when we get to the self-advocacy slide. Communicate with teachers. Um, these are seven tips, again, from Child Mind Institute. Um, start early, keep the teachers in the loop, be proactive, plan ahead, focus on collaboration, support your child's autonomy, love that one, and keep things positive. Your job at home is to keep things happy, I hope. I, that's one of my big regrets, and we'll talk about that maybe in a bit. But um, in addition to these seven tips, I think it's it's important to ask specific questions like, are my kids... Um, you know, what do they do at recess? Are they, do they, do they interact with their friends or do, appropriately? Um, or are they often misunderstood? Ask the teacher to observe your child socially as well. Um, don't forget to always ask for progress monitoring notes. It can happen more than just the IEP period or more than report cards. You can get them as often as you need. Um, and it's important that graded homework comes home so that you can keep track and keep everything in a binder. Um, volunteer and observe your, your child at school. That's always fun. Um, again, going back to homework, mark how long, um, if Johnny was supposed to do math for 20 minutes, draw a little line underneath 20 minutes if he didn't finish and say this is where he ended. Also, it's important um, to highlight words that you might have needed to read aloud to your child. Or even if you, if you had to read all the directions, make sure the teacher knows that. Um, I, I always would tell tell my teachers, they probably hated the billions of emails I sent times three kids, but if they had a rough day, I, I said so. I would send an email like, oh, we had a rough morning. Um, 
you know, make sure they know that they, if they don't want to read aloud, make sure that they're not calling on them to read aloud. Make sure routines are established for turning in homework so the kid isn't, you know, so he's getting credit for his homework, especially in middle school. Um, I'm going to move on. What we have here is communication with community. Um, back in back in the day when I was just getting started with um, raising my kids, I didn't know about any of these resources. And now they're out there. There's so many resources, so many um, websites that you can that you can hop on. Um, this just mentions a few, and I think that there are links to all of these in the resource sec section. Also, um, community like. Uh, my gosh, Emily, Emily Hanford, like she's, she's like Emily Hanford for president, as far as I'm concerned, her sold a story. Um, it's on a podcast now, if you haven't watched the videos, amazing. Um, other podcasts, I love Melissa and Lori love literacy. And there's another podcast um, from Amplify called the science of reading. Um, decoding dyslexia, huge shout out to decoding dyslexia on Facebook or anywhere you can find um, any decoding dyslexia branch, but specifically Massachusetts is amazing. And, and join your local CPAC if you haven't already. Okay, my final slide, I, th I think, yes. Um, how to build a self-advocate. This is my favorite topic. Um, and you'll see why in a second when you get to meet Lola, because she's a perfect example of what can happen, how great it can be once kids um, are confident in who they are and how they learn and um, can speak up for themselves. So we have to explain why advocacy is important and specifically why self-advocacy is important. We, the kids need to learn their profile. They need to understand their neuropsych eval and all of their academic testing. They need to understand their bell curve. They need to, they need to know all about the myths of, around dyslexia and um, tell them the facts so they feel understood. Um, visit websites together. Understood.org is amazing. It's huge. And there are um, videos of students sharing their stories. TEDx has some great ones. And I've linked a couple of my favorites um, in the resource section. Um, discuss their goals, dreams, and options often, early and often, and have them assist you in drafting their own vision statement and their student strengths. Um, more links in the resources. There's a web, there's a group called I'm Determined. And there are some printables that you can use that talk about a strengths and interests one pager to share with their teachers. Maybe they can even develop a slideshow similar to what Lola is going to show you in a minute. Um, if your child is on an IEP, make sure they understand what the heck that is all about. They should know when they're going to be pulled out. Um, they should know about their accommodations, know if they're working or not, like have frequent communication with them about their accommodations, make sure they're being delivered in all of their classes. Um, prepare them to participate in their meeting, give them a key role, even if it's just at the beginning for a few minutes. Um, I think students have to start to attend their IEP meetings when they turn 14, the transition age, but there's no reason that they can't start sooner. Um, build these little mini advocates. They're amazing. My, my boys went to their IMP meetings starting in fourth grade, I think. Um, if they're uncomfortable, they can do a video or an audio or um, some sort of a PowerPoint. We can, you can share those. And role playing is important, um, especially for younger kids, um, so that they can know how to advocate for themselves with teachers and even friends. And there's also a printable about nine steps to student-directed IEPs in the resource section. Oh my gosh, Susan, we did it. And it's 7.55, that's late. Um, hi. <laughs> Hello, nice job. And thank you so, so much.